Hello, my name is Dr. Freddy Garcia, and I'm joined by Professor Carrick, and we are once again together to carry on answering your questions for Ted and Fred's Excellent Venture. Professor, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's Good Friday. It's uh, Easter time, so I can wear my Easter ties, which uh, sort of just hang out waiting for me to look at the calendar. Sometimes I forget, and I just wear them anyways, you know, at the wrong date, but this is a real, this is a real good excuse to bring up those bright springtime sort of joyful uh, celebrations, even though we have some trying times right now. So I like Easter. Me too. Um, hey, so we, Professor, we pushed out that first video and the response has been really, really great. People love hearing from you and getting their questions answered. So I'm actually excited because we have more questions and uh, we're gonna get them answered for them. So let's jump into it. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So. Let me see, I picked out a few that I thought were are good. We have a, somebody to choose from. This first one is from Dr. Liz Anderson Peacock, and she says, how do you navigate a response when critics say that we have no business being in neurology with the, res, with the result to limit us to just low back and neck pain type therapies? Well, that's a hell of a question. Uh, I can tell you, I never have to answer those questions because the outcomes that we have are self-evident. And I think that um, I don't bother with negativity. Uh, how do you answer? How do you navigate it? Well, I think obviously, you know, research is the, is the way to do things. Um, it's a catch-22 because for much of the things that we do, you're never going to be able to develop a, a randomized control trial because of the variability, the... Uh, and then if you want to put a placebo in it to give sham, for instance, to the things that we do with head movement or eye movement and things is rather, is rather difficult. And then there's the question of equipoise. However, having said that, uh, we are dealing and assembling a very profound uh, meta-analysis of what we do in our clinical practices. And I think that really is the, the answer. We need to publish it, which we will be doing. But what you find is that, um, and, and I think this is from a, from a chiropractor, uh, the question from Liz, that there's many things that chiropractors do, and then there's chiropractic. So if a chiropractor tells somebody to do an exercise or to wash their hands, or if you, you notice like, you know, I wash my hands like mad, but I still, I have a big cut inside my beak. So you'll see uh, if you're talking to me now, I'll go up and I'll scratch it. But I can tell you, I'm real super clean. So <laughs> that's, that's one thing. But there's many things that chiropractors do. So when you look at um, a patient and you do a head turn or you do an adjustment or you do an extremity work or you do gait retraining or you do stabilization or you do balance, whatever you're doing, uh, within your scope is usually a product of, of what you're doing in central nervous system and concussion work or the treatment of brain. There's just no question about that. The problem that people have is that they delineate sometimes the concept that chiropractors do only an adjustment, nothing else. Like in other words, they don't speak to the person, they don't give them exercise, they don't give them advice on diet, they don't give them advice on lifestyle types of changes, which are all central to the, the paradigm of our practice. So we have a neurology focus group, which is multidisciplinary, that is collecting the, um, the evidence that has been published in regards to the things that we do. So I'll give you an example. If you, as a uh, chiropractor, uh, see me and I have injured my head, and I come in and I'm wearing the typical black glasses, I can't go outside, I, I have a problem with light sensitivity and noise, I'm living in a dark room, and you tell the person to uh, change the light bulbs to a blue color, and then to start to take off their glasses and, and to expose themselves over a period of, of time and get them out of that parameter, that is something that is an acceptable type of a type of a practice that can make a difference and it's not pharmacy it's not surgery and it's something that 
that you would do as, as a reasonable person, as well as a chiropractor. So it's really important to define what you do in your discipline. And you'll find that the majority of the things that you do, there's a very profound evidence base for it. But there's not an evidence base for a lot of the things that many doctors do of different disciplines, which is why most of my colleagues will prescribe off-label. Uh, people are knowing this now, like what do you do with this COVID-19 virus when there is no clinical trials? And you look at the evidence based upon your experience, patient outcomes, and, and of course, ideally, you know, good evidence starting from RCTs then going down until you've got a good feeling of what to do. So you will find, I think, in order to answer these questions, you need to know the literature, you need to know where the evidence is, and it's out there. If you have people that search under the name of chiropractic and a certain thing, you're probably gonna come up a little bit empty. But if you have a chiropractor that does vestibular rehabilitation, which many chiropractors do, even if they don't know they're actually doing that, uh, you, you find a whole different wealth of, of information. So having the knowledge of what you're doing is one thing. And you'll find out that any naysayers or detractors or people that talk about what you're doing without even knowing what you're doing. And I've had that a little bit, not too much, uh, you know, from people that are on the fringe, sometimes within my own profession, but sometimes just, you know, from, you know, some weirdos, but they're not in the mainstream. The mainstream uh, players in, in healthcare uh, like what I do, and those are the people that send their people to me. So whether I'm talking to the, uh, the medical doctor for a sports team, I get calls every day from these people. What do I do about this? And, and we can share and tell them what to do. If it doesn't work, then they send them in for us to see them. Better that we can get them fixed. So how do you deal with it? Well, first of all, it, why should you bother? If you're uh, a humanist and you're doing good work, it's very, very evident because of the number of people that are seeing you. And if there's a naysayer, hey, uh, you're not compelled. My grandmother, and this is sort of a, uh, you know, don't take offense of this, but she used to always say this, so blame her. But if somebody calls you from the mental institute, you're not required to return the call. And I think that's, that's the way it goes. Uh, you have some people <clears throat> just live on Facebook and you wonder, say, so I don't think this person sees any patients because they're <laughs> responding to a variety of things or they're on you know, quack watch or they're on this, that, or the other uh, sort of thing. Having said that, um, let's look at the evidence-based information and define what we're doing. One thing that you should read is the job analysis that's done by the American Chiropractic Neurology Board. They're uh, certified uh, by NCCA and an international group for their standards, which are, you know, boom, right up there. It's phenomenal. And they do a job analysis every few years, and that job analysis changes over the years as people's practices change, as uh, different modalities are utilized, as different computerization comes in. So if you read what the chiropractic neurologists are doing, you go, wow, this is really sort of amazing that they're doing this stuff. And then you read, how are they doing? You go like, I sort of do that too, but there's an evidence for it. So I think, you know, I'm sort of going in a circular, but uh, two main, a couple of main things. One, if, if they're really wacky in that, you don't have to respond to them because it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You can't, you can't, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them gargle sort of thing. Why waste your time? But I think it's important for us to be able to contribute to the healthcare team. And that means to be able to describe what we do accurately without any, any weird thing. And we have got some hundred year old hypotheses that are still uh, coming around in chiropractic that have been completely disproven. Um, with things that make better sense. So the observations of what you do are marvelous. And maybe the explanations sound a little bit scary or just not true. So, and I think everyone knows what we're talking about, you know, from, you know, releasing spirits or trepanation of skulls or, or putting leeches on people and balancing the humors of the body and, 
getting rid of phlegm and making sacrifices and throwing Joe into the volcano. Well, if you look at healthcare over the last hundred years, I mean, it's been, after the last 10 years, it's been crazy with acceleration and changing. And uh, many people in, in chiropractic embrace a, uh, a reticular theorem, which has been disproven, but was the basis of what we thought was an explanation of what we did a hundred years ago. It's not true. So you lose nothing with doing what you're doing, but being able to explain it through modern times and not soul searching or, or some sort of religiosity of, of sorts. I think everyone knows what we're talking about. So we have the evidence. Uh, we're gonna be publishing um, a meta-analysis fairly soon, but it's voluminous and good people are working on this and we need it. It's, it's responsible and once we have it, I think people can um, then step up to the point and, and say, am I trained enough to do the things that we say that we're doing? And <clears throat> scope so there you have it Liz that's the best I can give you for that so it seems to me like doing good work and not really sinking down to the to the level of the naysayers is it seems like it's a waste of time to do that anyways naysayers are good I mean I think they keep people they keep people authentic and uh, you know they had the problems in medicine years ago where the the doctor was mixing up his his potions in the bathtub and selling it to people so everyone that came in would get his certain potion. And that was seen to be a bias. And then they regulate it. And then they have pharmacies so that people don't mix up and sell their own pills. Um, and we have some reflection to do in some of our own practices where people might dispense, for instance, uh, an orthopedic appliance or a lumbosacral belt or an orthotic or so, you know, directly from their stock. Uh, and these potential biases are, are things that we have to deal with. Or if you're giving a supplement or a vitamin and you are prescribing or advising that and you're selling it and you're making a profit from it, um, that might be a bias that is different than if you sent someone to the drugstore uh, for the uh, your best potion, uh, for instance, that they might, they might look at. Or if you're trying to sell a series of of uh, treatments or selling a specific pillow or, you know, there's all sorts of things that we really need to look at and make sure that uh, for ourselves that it is something that we have that we can profit from that we are not biased. It's pretty obvious that if you've got uh, an x-ray machine, you're probably going to use it. And if you've got an MRI scanner, you know, we have these things, uh, we're probably going to use it. Um, and, and we've got different laws now that suggest that if you own one of these, there could be a conflict if you're sending in, you know, an exorbitant amount of people for that test that may be not needed. So when we look at therapies, if you are pretty skilled at a therapy, there's a pretty good chance that people are going to get what you're going to give. Or if you go to a chiropractor, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get an adjustment that may or may not be right. For instance, if you go to a surgeon, and everyone goes to that surgeon has a surgery, that's a pretty scary thought because there's probably some people that don't need that procedure and the person that does it should be skilled enough to say, hey, you know, th there's nothing for me to operate on, let me send you over here. But conversely, many of the things that physical therapists do or chiropractors or dentists or podiatrists or uh, OBGYN people, uh, you know, to dermatologists, are such that maybe you don't need it, you know, like maybe you don't need to have a freckle biopsy, you know, uh, these sort of things. So I think when it comes to what we do, we have to realize that we've got some, some bad in-house procedures that we have got to be reflective on. The general outcome though, I think is pretty marvelous. And uh, when you start to quantify everything you do, from the way you say hello to someone, to the color of the paint on your walls, to how your receptionist works with these people, the caring, the availability, the hand-holding, of course, the touching. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things in, in the things that, um, that all of us do that are pretty marvelous, but also can be explained and uh, can be explained in current, um, in current areas. So, let me just take uh, Liz's question and just talk about philosophy and talk about clinical science. Ph 
philosophy is one of the most important things we have. And I was fortunate enough years ago to uh, have some good exposures to just some amazing uh, people. Will Klein over at, at Harvard and that. And the basic concept is that a philosophical question is one that cannot be answered by empirical evidence. And empiricism is, is very simple. It means that it's true or it's false. There it is, it's dichotomism. But philosophy doesn't talk about what is true or false. Philosophy talks about things that make sense or don't make sense if you don't know if it's true or false. So many things in healthcare, we don't know what is true or what is false. And we use a, a philosophical understanding using that um, phenomenology to say, does this make sense or doesn't it make sense? sense. So Will Klein said something that really struck me and sort of changed my life was saying that once a philosophical question has been answered empirically, in other words, something that we didn't know and we sort of made sense of it, it makes sense that when we sacrifice this person and it rains that we appease this God. It made sense because every time we do it, you know, it rains maybe a month later, but you know, it rains, so it, so it makes sense. But all of a sudden, when you have a philosophical answer that makes sense of something that is now answered empirically, either true or false, then that question is no longer a question for philosophy. It's, it's no longer a philosophical question because it's empirically answered. The problem that many of us have is we are still trying to make sense out of things that we know are true or things that we know are false. And that is a big error. So our philosophy, let me tell you, there's a lot of things we just don't know the answer to. That's where philosophy comes into play. And some of the best philosophers that we have right now, I mean, we, I mean, amazing things, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, I've been a big student of his, probably the, the best, well, consider the best philosopher of our ages and looking as instrumental. I could talk about him for hours, but we've got people right now at MIT. We've got John Searle out on the West Coast. Uh, and all of these people who are philosophers are amazing neuroscientists, even though, and they use a philosophical aspect to answer the things as what makes sense of this stuff that we don't know. It's no longer that uh, Cartesian theater where you have a little man that's sitting in your head that's looking at the world. I mean, that whole idea of the little man within uh, in Cartesian theater, or even the Chinese theater from Searle, just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We know that the system doesn't work that way anymore. We know that, uh, we know how nerves carry impulses, and we know that they're we're not having, we know what the circulation of the blood does. Before Harvey, we didn't know. You know, we didn't know. We didn't know between Hodgkin and Huxley how we look at saltatory types of uh, conductions and what happens when you put a pressure on a nerve. And that sort of thing has plagued a lot of the chiropractors that thought that they would take pressure off a nerve. And of course, that is, that, that's, that's not true. That's not what, what happens when you give an adjustment. You put a pressure on a nerve, the nerve dies or portions of it die and you have uh, problems with a different aspect of uh, both muscle uh, dying and sensory disturbances and changes in spatial relationships. So um, many of the things, getting back to Liz's question, is that if you're going to respond to people who are negative, then you've got to respond with currency and not with a nonsensical aspect of what you believe to be true. In other words, that you could suggest that you sacrifice that naysayer and, and the, sun, the sun will shine or you won't have any nauseousness anymore. I think you know what we're, we're saying. So we're, we're there. I mean, I, I would say when you look at, especially with the discipline of neurology uh, in this profession, I mean, we, we, are, we have the best people. At our symposium, we, we have like the, the editor-in-chief of Lancet Neurology is, is at our symposium and looking at our abstracts and speaking. We've got deans from, you know, Ivy League uh, medical schools and presentations, and they're there because they want to know what we're knowing so they can help their patients. They send them in. 
So you don't have naysayers when you're speaking the truth and you don't have a problem saying that you don't know, but the problems are is that when you try to make sense of something that's already known, then you, you're sort of talking nonsense, we would say, or as Will Klein would say. So don't talk nonsense. If it's already discovered, you can't say, well, uh, that's what this shows, but I believe, well, that's fine. You can do that, but that's not philosophy. That's just an errant uh, opinion. Uh, and when you're a professional, you can't have opinions, you know, because you're a, you're a professional. So what you think in your, your own mind of, you know, whether you like broccoli or everyone should eat liver is, you know, that really is up to you. Anyways, we're going around. I think you get the idea. It's worked great for me. And I can tell, I just don't get naysayers. Uh, I, I get a few, you know, from different fringes, but my phone, I mean, I can't get off the phone from good quality institutions and top people that are doing the things I'm doing, whether they're looking in eyes or whether they're doing surgery in the brain or whatever. I get called for my advice on a variety of, of uh, things and they get called for theirs. So we have a, a teamwork, but people respect the thing. I can tell you they respect what I do uh, because they send their loved ones to me from across the pond. That's the reality of it. But uh, again, you don't have to be defensive. You don't respond with an excuse and say, well, look, I read this. I mean, who cares? You know, that's out there. But we need to publish uh, in good, uh, good sort of things. And you can't negate the levels of research. You know, we can give them a different grade. There's some things that we just can't do. When I started practicing, there was no evidence for anything that I did. And I had a good education at CMCC. I was prepared to do everything without evidence. I mean, there wasn't low back studies that were good uh, and, and chiropractors weren't even allowed to go to the same country club. I mean, that's, you know, that's the reality. Things have markedly changed and we've got a lot more evidence, but we need to realize that the majority of things that we see and do have not had the benefit of uh, quantitative research. Um, there is a great drive in medicine right now to look at a qualitative research aspect where you ask questions of patients and participants until there's saturation and these things have been really pioneered uh, by people because there are many things in the nervous system that we can't quantify it's really hard to study that so qualitative research you're seeing is going to have a big emergence you need to be trained to do it um, and I, i'm trained quantitatively but i'm also trained qualitatively and it's really hard to understand that. And I've never published anything uh, in regards to a qualitative research. We've got uh, one publication out this week where we use survey analysis and we have a quality with that, but we certainly quantify it. We look at our outcomes, but you'll see you know, many more uh, mixed methodologies of research that will be able to answer those questions. This is really the sort of a topic for a, for a focus group to sit down and say, okay, you know, how do, we, how do we put our best foot forward so that we can serve humankind? Not our best foot forward so we can serve ourselves, but what can we do so that people will be referred to uh, people that can help their needs? And we have to speak a similar language. And you know that sometimes, I mean, if you look at sometimes, We'll look at words like disease and we'll say dis. I mean, I mean, just why would we do this, you know? Or everyone in the world says the nervous system. People are talking about the nerve system. If you hear that from someone, it's just, it's not even, it's just different. Why do that? You know, we, we need to speak the same language. And if you want to look and say, uh, it's like the Hatfields and McCoys. Like you want to maintain your individuality and your difference, which means what? You know, you're going to be... You know, um, <laughs> you get caught here. <laughs> you can do things that are not so cool because that's what your family history is. The whole family is like nuts. So you want to maintain that identity. Sometimes the identity is not, any, is not good. And, and sometimes language is such that you can't reinvent it. Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, taught us that once you have a word that's associated with something, you can never make it anything different. You can't say vitalism and say, well, that doesn't really work anymore because it's not a good word. So we'll have neo-vitalism or we'll have quasi-vitalism or we're going to have 
post palmarian vitalism or yeah you know or post cahal vitalism or we're gonna have the i mean just say say what it is you can't reinvent a word because it has that that stigma especially words that are ubiquitous or words that are only known within one specific tribe in a certain square area of the amazon or so uh, we need to communicate and we need to use proper language uh, that everyone understands rather than speaking garbage. i can tell you watching a tv show and i'm good with languages with with a few of them and i'm watching this one and it's filmed in naples and that dialect the neapolitan dialect I'm having a hard time with it. I have to use the subtitles. Normally, I don't. I'm having a hard time. That's not Italian. You know, it's, it's a dialect that's just different. Now, if you're from Naples, you probably would understand what I'm saying, but it's just different, and it's really hard. It's almost like listening to someone speak in Hungarian. I have a hard time with Hungarian. You know, where the heck did that come from? I don't, I don't know. The roots are sort of different. Whereas French, Spanish, Italian, you know, you can understand German. Uh, sometimes English I knew pretty well with, but um, th the point is, is that if I need to have subtitles to understand what the person's saying, they've got to provide it if they want to communicate with me. Uh, although I probably watched this, uh, whatever. Let me tell you one funny story. And then, because this is just a chat that Freddie's and I have, but I love like, you know, climbing, you know, big hills and things like that. So I was in Amsterdam and they had a film called Himalayas, and I like the Himalayas, and I like Everest and, and this sort of thing. That's a whole other uh, discussion at one time. But in any event, they had this film about climbing Everest, but it was, it was seen through the eyes of the Sherpas and, and that whole familial aspect of what these Sherpas were. And so I looked at it. It was done by a French uh, realizateur, for the French you know, movie maker, the director, and it was done in Nepalese, but with subtitles. So I thought, boy, this is, this is great. So I went to watch this movie, and it was in Nepalese, but the subtitles were in Nepalese too. So it, it didn't help me, but, but I am a good observer. I love that film. I understood 100% of it. I think, I mean, the facial expressions were so rich, and I wasn't cursed with words. I could look at these people, you know, I can see them when they're cooking things on yak fat and that. I mean, I could, I could get that whole gist of it, but it was effortful. And I think that when we talk to other people that are naysayers, sayers, if we're using language that is effortful for them, you know, let's let's go and get one with English subtitles or so, and uh, we're going to be fine. But as my grandmother said. You don't have to answer the call if it's really, you know, if it's really out there. Excellent. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Let's go on to the next question. I have a question from Dr. Mark Friedman, and he asks, what is the most effective way to deal with photosensitivity in concussion patients who have a normal ophthalmologic uh, examination? Uh, and they've tried a few things. So I guess, can, can we dive into the neurophysiology of photosensitivity maybe after, yeah, like, like he asked, for a concussion patient? Well, first of all, and, and thanks for Mark, but I had almost everybody that comes in with a concussion, I say he's got photosensitivity. And let me tell you, they don't have normal ophthalmological examinations because you can't look in their eyes very well. If, if they're photosensitive, you take that ophthalmoscope, when you're looking in their eye, they can't tolerate it. They go off the table. That's the reality of it. So right away, when, when you have somebody that says to me, or I have residents say, well, the person's photosensitive, but the ophthalmological examination was normal. I go, that doesn't make sense. And then I look for different, different sort of things. So right off, right off the bat. So when you look at photosensitivity, that's about <clears throat> not number one, but almost number one, at least number two in the symptoms that people have with brain injuries. It's just that, uh, that huge. And you may have photosensitivity if you have lesions of integration because your neck is awry into your thalamus or your vestibular system, especially in the superior colliculus. But most often we see aberrancies uh, with the autonomic nervous system. Now let me share you some things that we're finding that are absolutely fantastic that you couldn't do six months ago uh, for, for cheap. 
for reasonable aspect, and that is the uh, pupillary light reflex. So everyone knows what it is. I mean, you've got a certain size of your pupil, and they may be different from one side to the other, have some anisocoria. There's some physiology in regards to that aspect, or that the size of the pupil is really the result of a tug of war between the system that would cause the pupil to be big and the system that would cause the pupil to be small, or we say a tug of war between the sympathetic activator of the pupillodilator muscle, and that's really a complex system, comes from the brain uh, with primary areas in your hypothalamus and then goes down through the cord to the level of T1, and then out from that cord upwards along the carotid vasculature, it branches into external to your face, but then dives deep in and the first intracranial branch of that uh, carotid artery goes to uh, it goes you know to your eye and causes pupil uh, dilation so that's a long pathway and you can have a lesion anywhere along it that can cause this or if you've got lesions in the brain the ability to inhibit or excite that intermedial lateral cell column which activates the uh, the sympathetic system cannot be uh, appropriate. On the other hand, you've got shorter parasympathetic uh, activities that uh, evoke activity in the midbrain from the end of Westfall nucleus. It's a very primitive type of response and very, very quick. A uh, light comes into the, into the eye. You have this passes through the tegmentum into the tectum, and then you have this bilateral constriction of eyes. But you also constrict eyes with a, an aspect of accommodation if you have uh, the ability to converge your eyes. Now, people that have concussion, almost everyone I've seen, and I, I can't even think of an exception, uh, and I think the literature supports this, have a convergence insufficiency, which means to say that if you look at a target, you bring it up to their eyes, their eyes should focus at this target, and they should be able to uh, come and follow that target without one eye going off uh, on its own up to roughly about six centimeters from their beak. And if they don't, we say they've got insufficiency of uh, convergence. And then we give them different therapies from, you know, Brock strings or targets near, far, etc. So if you've got convergence insufficiency, you've got a triad that if you don't converge, that your, your amount of pupillal constriction will be less. And uh, that's part of this accommodation aspect. So let me put it into a, into a, I think a better package, maybe for people that don't know neurology very much. Uh, what are the biomarkers we know about light coming into the eyes? Well, we know that if you're in a cinema and you're watching a movie and it's really dark, you all know this, or that you're watching Steve Reeves. That was my hero. He, Steve Reeves is like Hercules Unchanged, and he'd be throwing javelins like across the world. And, and we'd watch this movie, and then we'd come out, and I'd say, wow, man, it would just hurt your eyes because you come from that dark room, and you come out of the theater, and you're going, oh, wow. Ah. Now, you, you're sitting there, and you feel like Steve Reeves. You don't know the word photosensitive, but you know that you got to sort of squint until your eyes become, become okay again with the light. Well, when you hurt your head, that's what it's like all the time. And the first question that you ask your patient, were you watching a Steve Reeves movie? And they go, no, they go, oh, I'm probably having a concussion. So here's what happens is that when you're in that movie, your eyes are going to be dilated because it's dark or in the dark, your eyes are going to be bigger than in the light. And then when you go up to the light, they, they've got to constrict and it takes time. When you have a concussion, and you shine a light in the, in the person's eye and you have a constriction of the pupil, the time it takes to get to 75% of the original before you shine the light in is much longer when you've had a concussion. Mm -hmm. So what we say is that we wanna measure the time for the pupil to dilate to 75%, not even up to where it was when you started, but up to 75% and it's long. It takes a long period of time. Now, what are we seeing clinically in our practice? Well, we're looking at people that are taking uh, 12, you know, 11, 12 seconds to get back up to that time. And then many of them overshoot 
and become bigger than they were before. Some of them develop what we call hippus, where they got this boom, 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 parasympathetic effect. So I am, the, the evidence is, is rather beautiful that you can have lesions in different parts of the brain that result in dysautonomia. We, we know that to be, to be uh, true, and we know that we treat that dysautonomia very specifically by treating different areas of the brain that we find out are wrong, not because of the dysautonomia, but because of functional tests and instruments that are specific for those areas. So when you have someone who is photophobic, I suggest that you quantify it by looking at the time to recover after a light response. Now, in a clinical office, people are sitting there, so you're not seeing what their maximum you know, dilation and constriction is because you've got different ambient light. There you have it. You're not in a lab where you can sit, okay, sit here for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We're gonna do some infrared activity and see you know, how big your eyes are. We're gonna turn the lights on. We're gonna see how much they constrict. Then we're gonna turn the lights out and see how long it takes you to get back to that thing. That's a lab, but that's not what we do. You know, you're looking at people, you know, in an ambulance or an accident, you shine a light on, that's what we do. We wanna see if, you know, if you've lost that response or if it's dampened. So right now, they've got a new app. It's on your iPhone. It's crazy, crazy good. It's called the um, Reflex PLR, the Reflex, I don't know what it is, Reflex Pupillary Light Response or so. Uh, Fred, you can look at it when I'm, when I'm talking. It's called about. Reflex, just called, called Reflex. Reflex app, and it's sort of pupillary light reflex. Now. I've used pupillary light responses, you know, at the bedside forever and ever. And I, okay, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, there it is, reflex. It's a little squiggly. And I've also got, you know, the fancy little guy that comes in, but it's, it's big bucks. You're looking at several thousand dollars. And this thing is, is cheap. Uh, and I think, I don't know how cheap it is, but I think it's like a few hundred bucks a year. And it's on you, your you, you get the first 60 days free anyways to play around with it. It is yeah, excellent. 60 days free. And you do thousands of people. So it's really cool because you take this app and you, you just hold it in front of the eyes. It also gives a, a flash or you've got different simulations you can do. And you can set it and it gives you exact numbers every millisecond over the time you set it. So we look at it in concussion clinics. We've got enough people and we see and we agree that uh, the sensitivity of this device is amazing. So when you compare it to the gold standard in this little app, it's there. In other words, the, the ICC between the two tests is amazing. It's really high. When we look at the Cronbax Alpha, it's reproducible. So it's a, it's a great test. So when we look at photophobia, I think you'll find that you're looking at dysautonomia or the end consequences of whatever things are, whether it's in the superior colliculus or not. So what is the difference between a frontal uh, induced dysautonomia that causes a prolonged recovery rate of the pupillary response to some of the superior colliculus? Well, the answer is rather simple. If you've got a superior collicular lesion, you're not gonna be able to activate these omnipause inhibitors of uh, psychotic burst neurons, and you're gonna have a different latency, but you also will not have the ability to generate express psychotics uh, if you look at some, at, at a patient and you give them a gap overlap of the stimulation, whereas a person with a frontal type of a cortex is gonna have a greater difficulty, for instance, with anti saccades in comparison with the spirit collicular one. And you can go through each individual area of the brain to look at what that functionality is so that you can nail the target of your therapy and then measure to see whether that therapy does have the autonomic consequence that you're looking at. So let's just make it nice and simple. Uh, people that injure their head become photophobic. They can't stand looking in their eyes. So when we look in their eyes, um, I usually use a filter. I usually use a blue filter, a green filter. It lets me look at them a little bit longer. Uh, you've all been to the optometrist and had your eyes dilated, right? And you come out of that and you go, what the heck? You're like that. You think for the rest of your life. You, you can't drive your car. You got to wear these black glasses. 
and you can't go to a bank. They think you're going to rob them because you're looking a little bit weird and they tax it. But you know how when they put midriatic drops in, how photosensitive you can get. That's what concussion people feel like. So that every time if you turn your head and just light from your environment's coming in, if you don't respond appropriately to, to a level of uh, pupillary size that lets in an amount of light that you can tolerate, then away you go. Or if you sit and you look like the eclipse is coming, let's look at it. No, don't look at it, it's gonna hurt you. You can't look into the sun. You can't look into bright lights. You can't go if you, they got some little devices you can buy like if you don't want to shoot people, you don't want to buy a Glock and you know, you're, you're such a wimp, you don't have the strength to tase somebody. You get these, dee -dee -dee -dee, these flashing lights and someone comes to you, you flash it and it just, you know, deer in the headlight numbs them up. So the use of light and startle responses, deer in the headlights are really well known. And when you've had a concussion, concussions are complex. It takes us, it takes us a few years to teach people to the fellowship level that we have in neurology to be able to treat concussions. And I can tell you, without equivocation, if you haven't been fellowship trained by someone that's credible, then you probably are not going to be able to give the level of care that you could give if you were. Doesn't mean you can't treat them, but I'm going to say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't send someone I love to see you. Uh, I think you need more skills. There you have it. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the, the way it is. And if, if you want somebody to replace a valve in your heart, uh, you want someone who's had a six-year residency and was chief of their fellowship program. You don't want someone that's just, you know, done two of them or three of them or, you know, no, you know what, what happens if things go down. So you need to train. And that's what we do, you know, really, really well. So I would get that app, that Reflex app, and look at that. I think you're going to find... If you've had a concussion, statistically, with good RCTs, you're going to see that the time to recover to 75% is prolonged with everyone. If you've had a concussion, the latencies of your cigars can be longer. Now, we um, published a paper this past year that looked at changes in saccades or fast eye movements after a concussion. And we looked at those in regards to depression and quantify them very well. And I presented that paper at the World Congress of um, Mental Health and Brain in, um, in Cambridge, uh, at Cambridge University. And that's published in uh, Psychiatrica Danubia. You can get that or, or call us. It's a, well, of course we're credited, but it's a good paper. It's not an RCT, but it's a before after intervention paper that showed uh, statistical significance less than 0 0.05 and power greater than 80%, confidence intervals that didn't cross zero uh, with a uh, really good Cohen's D and Hedges G uh, effect that showed that the effect size or the substantive significance was super, super up there. And then a recent paper that came out this week on PubMed with the, uh, with the vertical responses. We are gonna be looking at our group in regards to light responses. Let me tell you something that's really cool, Freddie's. Um, when we look at, we know this happens with concussion. So what happens if you get a bunch of young, ha, you know, happy uh, people, uh, you know, doctors, you know, medical chiropractors, this and that, you say, okay, you're normal people. And then we look at this, guess what we find? 25% of them have dysautonomia in regards to these responses. Something's wrong with their noggins. Then you talk to them, oh, you know, yeah, you know, I played, you know, football when I was, you know, five, or, you know, my mom used to drop me on my head because I had a fat head. She used to like how I bounced, or, you know, I used to ski or something, you know, and I thought it out. You find these things. So normal people have abnormal aspects. And going back to what Liz had said or how we started our conversation today, you'll find that if you use technology which is validated and there's an evidence-based effect for that uh it, it, if i come into you and i've got a prolongation and it takes me 14 seconds for my for my pupil to come to its previous state after light flash everyone knows that that's wrong everyone knows that that's wrong let me tell you the other thing is most people can never fix that on people it just doesn't go away by itself. Sometimes it does, but not usually. 
and all of a sudden you start doing and you start fixing that and then you publish that the naysayers are going to say holy moly you know th this is amazing these are back you probably are not going to have an rct but it's going to be evidence enough years ago we had a concussion oh symposium at harvard and i was literally at that time i was about the only person using uh very act the vestibular therapy that that we do with whole body rotations and things and that really took the world by storm but it was like very controversial at first because uh it's no one had done it well then we you know published on it and did things and other people are doing it and they're doing it with success so whether you're at a big rehab place or you know uh, if you look at the uh, UPMIC, pe people now are looking at optokinetic stimulation. They're looking at times one and two viewing, and people are doing, you know, better jobs. And, and I think a lot of the, you know, from from we've from what we've done because we started attracting the majority of head injuries and still do um, because our outcomes are pretty amazing. And also, we don't fail if it's not working. We get rid of them. We you know say we're not going to be good for you. We want immediate. What do we see patients? Our average cases is like five days. I mean, that's what they're doing. That's what we're doing at the Plasticity Center with Antonucci. That's what Azolino's doing at the West Coast. That's what uh, Michalopoulos and Kraft are doing in Chicago. Schmo in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, people down in LA, Shad Groves, uh, Julie Brown, uh, John uh, McLaren. I mean, all sorts of great people, you know, Winnipeg with uh, Jason. So we've got amazing, Ben Balsamback, get this, he's one of our guys. The results are so great that he's gonna be building a clinic, I believe like at Schiphol Airport. And they got people that, you know, from, from the healthcare community, so you've got to come in here because no one else can do that. They want him at Schiphol. Have you been to that? It's, it's amazing. Casper Andresen um, was doing this work in treating the, um, the Swiss downhill team and javelin things. I mean, great big, you know, press and aspects of outcomes. So it's really interesting when you look at people and you're seeing patients that have been to everybody and all of a sudden they go to see you and then they're better and back to in five days. And then you do it again and again. This is almost like the story where the, uh, the chiropractor brings a pig to a convention. And they go, what the hell is this pig doing? He gets up there and he manipulates the atlas and the pig stands up on his back legs and starts singing and he sounds like Havarati. It's amazing. People are going, that was the most beautiful song I've ever seen. And it was sung by a pig. Then you have other people go, oh, it's just one pig. Oh, who cares? I want to see a choir of pigs. I mean, come on, you just saw the pig that was singing. So all of a sudden, you start doing this <laughs> and you get your choir. People know about it. It's just amazing. You say, well, what happens when you put it in a cow? Blah, 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 blah. So uh, light responses, uh, whether, and we can do the same thing with auditory types of phenomena, <clears throat> but light sensitivity is absolutely huge. Uh, people come in. I don't think I've ever seen anyone that come in that doesn't have those black glasses. Some people, they just can't go anywhere. Not only can can they not do it, but oftentimes they'll get a migrainous event. If you have a vasolar migrainous event, or you look at activity uh, with uh, that affects the posterior circulation of your brain, then when you look at pursuits, you don't have the ability. Even looking at that transfer is getting up to V1 becomes very very taxing for people, and they start getting different uh, colors and different aspects and anterior circulation that affects your eye or a typical migraine when you get uh, fortification spectra scintillating types of scotomas or different types of um hemianopsia, hemianopsias or even people have oscillopsia they have uh, you know photophobia as well so we know the mechanisms and we know the diagnostic criteria to look at different parts of the brain that can affect that autonomic control system and the proof is in the pudding. In other words, if whatever you're going to do, if you're going to get your pig to sing, but the recovery rate is, is not affected, then you're, you're not going to affect that light response. And, and the singing pig is not the therapy that you need, even though it's really entertaining. And, and onwards uh, we go. But I got a choir of bacon, you know, in, in 
<laughs> in my life. That's just the reality of it. Okay, I, I, that would go in. I think Freddie's, I can talk about pathways and light sensitivity in great detail, but that is something that we do in our educational courses, and it's complex. And I think that uh, it wouldn't be kind to some people that are not trained at that level to, to go into that depth. Well, I think this is a good start for them. You know, speaking of the PLR app or the Reflex app, I got to say, I, I am also very impressed with it. I think it may be fun to do a future uh, Ted and Fred adventure. Maybe we just talk about that app and kind of the reports to kind of show people how to use it a little bit. Uh, maybe worth doing. Yeah, I know there's a lot to it, but it's, it's it, amazing. I'm just in, it is amazing. I just love the way it's so compact and on your, on your phone. That's what makes it amazing. Yeah, it, Professor it, it, just about that app, which is really good. And again, you know, no disclosures. We don't have anything to do with it. It's not ours. Uh, I wish it was, but um, they're developing educational parameters and a back thing. Their stats are amazing. And what we're doing with the TBI fellows is we're collecting the data on their concussion patients and that, and we're getting just high, high numbers, more than anybody in the world. So we're getting this information and the data is exquisite. So that's great. But let's say you're, a, you're in, in general practice and you want this thing. It is really amazing for patients too because you hit the button and you can export it to a nice PDF that, that shows people sort of the chart of how they're doing. And they've developed a little, a little, um, it's not even proprietary, but it's a number. Like you've got some NPI numbers that give you a general pupillary score, but no one knows how that score is developed because it's a proprietary thing. This group it says the heck with proprietary stuff. We're going to be very transparent and show you our data and how we did it, how you can do it yourself. How good is this? It's, 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 it's amazing. I really think that, I mean, there's a couple of things that people should have. You should have that pupillary app. It's cheap. It's unbelievably great. You should have Brain EQ, which is amazing, and especially you know coming you know coming in now the virtual aspect. You should have the the uh, right eyes because I think that traction is super super great. You should have a Maddox rod and a double Maddox rod because that is super 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 important of what we're doing. You should have uh, a force plate of quality and that force plate we did a, a research paper that uh, we published and presented at cambridge looking at the metrological aspects of force plates and there's a standard now people are going to be hard to believe that most of the devices that you can get don't meet that standard and then you can make an argument say well do you really need to meet the standard well if you're checking my blood pressure i'd like to know that what you're seeing is is that the standard that you've got good metrological aspect? So the best one, and again, I have uh, no uh, disclosures, but a couple of my colleagues, uh, Guido uh, Pagnaco and Elena Jero, uh, are the developers of the stimulator technologies that make the caps. Theirs is the best foot plate. They got a caps light, which is affordable, and they lease it. I like it. There's a time I didn't like the caps that much. They had a, a better one that came out of Belgium. I was, and again, you know, I love their faculty, but I, I look at what the best is for my patient. But that company went out of business, so it's caps again. I like Burtech as well. That's pretty good. The old, uh, the Neurocom has had so much research, big bucks. We've had those. I think it's 150 bucks or so. Guess what? We put like a solid weight, like a stone on it, and it showed that the stone had sway. It's crap. It doesn't exist anymore. It's bad. Now, what happened, Burtek, when the, the patent went, Burtek bought it, and then Burtek just shut it down. Why didn't they continue selling it? It's a big buck thing. Didn't hit the standards. So a lot of the literature that's based upon those, those, uh, those tests it is, you know, you have to question it. But other people say, well, it's good enough. I don't know. So I would say one of the things is get, get the caps light. It's cheap. Or if you've got some money, get the real caps, which is phenomenal. The caps light gives better little graphics and things for patients. The, the, the big caps, super caps, you need to know what you're doing to, to utilize a little bit more because you need to be able to interpret. You need to have a good blood pressure cuff. You know, you need to have pulse oximeters are, are things that you need to do. You need to have a measuring tape. Those are expensive. 
just looking at convergence. You need to have something to go on your wall, like a ruler on your wall. Simple test, if you get someone to stand and you put a ruler on your wall and you get them to back up, back up, back up, back up, and put their hands out until their fingertips touch the edge of that ruler, and they say, okay, lean forward. They lean forward as far as they can. They should be able to move forward 10 inches. If they can't do 10 inches without falling, these people are very unstable. They're gonna, they have a very high probability of falling. Mm. Falls are the greatest cause of death. That's a cheap, cheap, cheap ruler on the wall test. If you don't want a ruler, you put a little line or you put drapes, but you should do that. Those things are, are little cheap things that you can do in your, uh, in your office, as well as having something, if you can't afford like a D2, where you do it, you can go and you can um, just make a little chart and just put little, you know, numbers or something and, and just, you know, change those charts and get people to hit, you know, hit different numbers or right side or left side hand eye activity. You should probably have like a 10, uh, 10 meter, you know, or you can do 10 feet, but say a 30 foot uh, gate uh, examination aspect that you can put a line on the floor and you should have a stopwatch or use your phone. Look at that. You should have a chair that people can sit and get up and, and walk around and, and do those little things. So uh, at the end of the day, to, to have a very viable modern neurological practice, regardless of your discipline, the tests are all the same and everyone uses the same test. It doesn't cost you that much money to give you good quality aspects. In other words, you don't need like a gyrostim to spin people all around. Most of my life is spent, you know, in, in, the, in the hospital. And when I see patients, I mean, I'll put them on a chair and I can spin them. I can do things. I, I can do that stuff. That's how it all started, right? Um, if you've got the money, those things are really great if you know how to use it. But if you don't know how to use it, I think you might not be doing a good, a good service because it's not a panacea. The press loves it. I, they come in and they show the gyrostim where you look at people and say, oh, yeah, so-and-so was treated the gyrostim. If you're thinking, no, they weren't. <laughs> or they were on to like a little wee thing. And they were treated with such and such. So you don't really need all of that. If you got a playing field, you get an ice rink that you can do, swimming pools, you know, engage this type of activity. Our world has changed now. Um, so people are going to be able to be treated, you know, at home or at a distance. And... A lot of the things that we do, you can change people's lives by giving, whether it be like a, a Baron Daroff exercise or, or something that is really cool. Uh, when you do something that has got good um, clinical evidence, clinical evidence that people use and you utilize it, there's no naysayers because your results are going to be better. To be able to know which test to do, in other words, not everybody who has vestibulopathy is given repositioning moves or, uh, you know, BD exercises or times one or type two viewing or snags or manipulation or cross crawling mechanisms or convergence sort of things and gate retraining and mental aspects. And they may do one of them or someone else maybe do something different. The key in, in good clinical aspect is to know which one to use that's got your biggest buck and then to be able to measure it. So if you want to look at the back, uh, you know, for, for, for depression, we use that. We used, uh, we use a variety of different validated scales to measure our outcome. And when you find that you have the greatest change in that outcome, then that becomes a, a standard that other people are going to, to want to, uh, to do. See what happens with these chats, Freddie? No, no, no. I, going I, like a peripatetic beast going all over the place. Here, here's what I know is going to happen. That list of tools that you suggested, everybody's writing it down furiously. So maybe we'll put it in the show notes or something. You know, well, we, mentioning we don't the, sell them. We don't we mentioned, sell them. <laughs> mentioning the gyro stem, I'm, I'm a fan of the mark because I like having three axes available. If, if, if in case I need it, just, just my, my personal bias uh, when it comes well, to full body. Well, that's self-evident, you know. I mean, that, that mark with three axes, it, it sort of puts the other one into the dinosaur phase. And a lot of our it's, people have two axes. You can use two axes. You can use one axis. But if you got three, is, is it better? Yeah, of course it's better. And what you're finding is that roll axis at the same time makes a phenomenal difference. And I can tell you because I was the first one to do clinical applications with the two axis machine. It wasn't... I was the first one 
to develop those. Now a lot of people can do it. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, I came from looking at chairs and other things, which I still use. The two axis, that third axis is absolutely amazing. I mean, that was the missing link. But it also is like twice or three times as expensive too. So, so it's a big machine. It's getting yeah. smaller though. I, the advances you're making on it are are amazing, and it is a joy to it is a joy to use and work with, and uh, you know serves right. patients really well. I'd love so it. Here, cheaper man that'd be cool it, it is happening one of the things that you talked about you actually covered a lot of it uh we have a question from a student he's graduating soon thompson masaka uh he says what new technology discovery is the next big leap that will significantly advance clinical efficacy put a different way what's new and exciting on the horizon and you just talked about a lot of technology um but what do you think is new and on the horizon that's going to really help these clinicians get better clinical efficacy what if you had to pick one or two things what, what's out there what do you think well it, it's very clear and there's no argument about it is that computerization has changed our world because we can get numbers for things that we could never get before so we've got better measurement tools and we've got advancements in imaging like never before uh, when i started practice uh, someone came in with radiculopathy uh, we would order a venogram and uh, this lumbar plasmography and, and the aspect was that if a disc was bulging you have the intradural venous pressure you put pressure on it and the vein would swell that was the standard and then shortly after that when I started practicing we went to metrizomide uh, myelography so we would do a myelogram and everyone that you'd come in and you'd see the old metrizomide up on their neck i mean that stuff would stay in there for the end of the end of time and then i was i remember i remember like yesterday i think i was at uh, um it was at west palm beach at cervical spine uh, symposium for society and they had the first uh, presentation of um of MRI. I mean, no one had seen it and it would just wheel out. That was the first time they did it. It was like amazing where you could look at, you know, spinning. And I remember sitting there, I remember, you know, a couple of old dudes saying, yeah, that'll never catch on. You know, you got a magnet, you know, that'll never catch on. Well, you know, no one does myelograms anymore. I even helped a vet do a myelogram on a dash hunt. This is crazy. You talk about things you a dash hunt because I used to show, you know, dobies and things. Anyways, I had these vet things and these dashes, you know, the wiener dogs have these long backs so they get bad discs. So if you ever seen a dashing getting a myelogram, I mean, this is crazy. I guess, you know, that's, you know, veterinary science. So uh, imaging is amazing. So we've got different aspects where we can look at function. Functional MRI is super, super great and bold. You're gonna see much more of, of that. Uh, tractography where you can actually see individual pathways and label them are, are absolutely great. Now, that's for structure. For function, the advancements in neurocognitive testing are really changing our whole understanding of how the brain works. Cambridge Brain Science is really a big leader in that area. And uh, I think that, um, well, we were gonna, we're gonna the, I know the principal who's a good friend. I mean, he's given, I, I don't know, like $60 million by the Canadians to come from England and go to University of Western Ontario. That's how, how big it is. But they're saving, changing and saving lives. And uh, we're really excited. They're excited about us because at the end of the day, we used to think neurocognitive was a footprint. Our people, that's our clinical aspect, changes that footprint. That's pretty unique. When you look at something that is resilient to a variety of things, and all of a sudden we change it, they go like, what the heck is happening? So the neurocognitive is really super, super amazing. We've got different tests which are very vibrant. I mean, the classic ones that we're using, you know, for many mental examinations, which are tried and true, Glasgow coma scores are becoming, uh, you, you know, uh, better understood. SF36s have to be done in every clinic just in regards to satisfaction, the BECs, uh, different anxiety scales, the functional gait indexes. And I think that you'll find that a lot of the things that are galloping in are not costing society so very much money. Pencil and paper, paper tests that are, that are really 
uh, sort of super. Remember, we had that emergence of thermography a few years ago, and you, you know, I had a whole lab uh, doing you know thermography and all of this liquid nitrogen. It was pretty cool and good for breast cancer and other things. And I'm not so much of a great fan of it anymore, having done it for a few years and becoming pretty expert with that, I find that you can do it different ways. And now you got these little guns that can, you want to look at temperature of someone, z, 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 you, know, you find the hot spots right there. It's almost like that old, you know, Gonstead and thermograms and uh, whatever the hell they, they call those things. So um, the paper and pencil, the computerization, being able to give us data that we never ever thought we'd have minutely, whether it be a flash into the eye, uh, whether it be the degree of sway that people are coming to. At the end of the day, uh, especially in neurological practice, we have to look at the things that people want to do. So in the Parkinson's literature, everyone knows about tremor, but the tremor doesn't bother the Parkinson's patient as much as their inability to do different things, uh, whether they're freezers or whether they can't go into rooms or the forgetfulness or the oncoming dementia. Uh, there's a whole load of things that we can't, that don't do well uh, with uh, dopamine. Some of them do. And then of course we get dyskinesias uh, as a consequence of the drug. And then we have got a whole different, it's a, it's a big battle. So there's a lot of interest. Uh, the biggest interests are in these non-pharmaceutical applications. It's amazing this last year in Paris, we had a wonderful symposium and just looking at advances in the treatment of different uh, movement disorders from surgical to drug. I mean, obviously we can find a new drug that's going to uh, be efficacious. People will welcome that. There isn't. If we found a new vitamin or supplement that you could take, yeah, that'd be great. There isn't, but there's great promise for Tai Chi uh, movement aspects for walking, for patterning in preventive aspects. I know in my lab, if you take a rat and you put them on a treadmill, uh, and these are, what I do is I, as I make uh, Parkinson's animals, I have an alpha synucleinopathy uh, animal and I've got a tauopathy animal for, for Alzheimer's. So we, we create these genetically. We also have these MPTP animals where I inject a, you know, a poison, MP, MTPP, into the animal and we kill these dopaminergic cells to make a Parkinson's. But that's not cool therapeutically because if you kill a bunch of cells um, that are dopaminergic, then you can't use the ones that are left with a the therapeutic application. So the genetic models are really good, but it's very expensive. It costs me a whole load of, of, uh, of money, but you know, I breed them now. So uh, I've got a whole cohort and I'm utilizing these animals, we're understanding, I can, t oh man, I'm so excited. But we look at different things where we look at, you know, putting them on a rod, see how they walk and uh, looking, how, how do they relate with their peers? What's their aggressivity? What is their docility? Looking at how much do they eat? What is their BMI? Uh, do they learn? So you take these, these animals, even the alpha synucleinopathy uh, rat, we put them in a, a Y case. Uh, if, you, if you put an animal like a rat or a mouse into a, into a, a maze and it branches off and you put like a, a, a chess piece, like a rook and a knight, then they're going to spend half time with each of them because they're novel. And then the next day, if you go and you take the rook and you put a bishop there, a normal animal will spend half the time, uh, not half the time, they're, they're gonna be spending a little more time with the novel than the other. But the, the rat with alpha synucleinopathy doesn't change. In other words, it doesn't know what is novel hmm. equal time with the one. If you hang a rat by its tail, or they don't like that. You, know, you can imagine if they did it to you. So they, they fight, they wanna bite you. But if you look at someone, when we create brain lesions or if they're demented, they just hang, you know, they, they lose their fight. Uh, and we find this is a, is a big thing with humans where people will say, hey, go out to dinner, you know, enjoy your time, you know, I'm fine here. They're not saying, they just don't have the affect. They don't want to go. It's that loss of, of different autonomy. So we talked about computerization. We talked about imaging. We talked about the advances in neurocognition and the advancements and the knowledge of how to utilize valid instruments and how to develop new uh, valid instruments. We've got 
uh, I think a good uh, contribution from uh, Howie Vernon from CMCC in regards to his next scale that's been used by a whole lot of people. And then the list gets pretty short for our contributions and, and we utilize you know some things from some other people. Well, we also developed some scales and validated it with my team's research in, in diabetes that you know, I'll be glad to talk to you about, but how we can look at, um, if you're depressed, you're probably gonna have type two diabetes. You got type two diabetes, you'll probably be depressed. And we so show- you, you, you have a paper on this, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, no, let, let's, let's save that one. I wanna, I wanna talk to you about that paper yeah. thoroughly. So let's, let's save that one for now. We have a couple, we have a couple because you know, we're, we're changing lives and saving lives, uh, doing things and just as a basic teaser. Uh, everyone treats diabetes the same. You'll give them the same sort of drugs. But if you do something else to one group and you get a better change, their diabetes goes away, their depression goes away. And that's a, uh, what we call a functional neurological paradigm approach to the mental health without drug. Uh, that's pretty impressive, right? That's pretty impressive. And uh, we are impressed. And we're looking at thousands of people in our study, not like 13 or, or 14. We use like a whole country. And uh, I'll tell you how we do that. I mean, that's sort of exciting. But I'll also tell you why people want us to do that. So I don't give the naysayers. I have people say, can you please come over and let's do this? And, uh, and we'll see what's happening. Again, we can't go and take one group and take away drug that's going to you know, save their, their toes from being cut off. You know, you've got to, you have to treat people. And... Uh, and realize that some of the some of the clinical trials that that you do can't i mean this isn't mengala this you know we've had we've got rules since nuremberg and belmont and helsinki of what you can do you know years ago freddy's and this is really cool um with liberty mutual they did these isometric lifting tasks and mm -hmm. what was found and i know these guys really super well is that if you exceed your isometric lifting task you're going to hurt your back you know badly so how did they find out? Because they hurt people. So what happens is an isometric lifting task is such that you're going to contract your muscles with all your force, but you can't move the item you're, you're doing. And we can measure that. Well, how do you know what your maximum is? Because at your maximum, you get hurt. So we don't do that, but we've got the data. They had the other guy, you know, the crash test dummies. They used to use people. I think it's University of Michigan or so. They get volunteers, these students, they pay them. 50 bucks, they put them in these things and they accelerate them into the wall and they look at their whiplashes and see, you're not allowed to do those studies anymore. Well, thank God, right? And how many of the things that we're gonna do, it's like the, uh, the physician's aspirin study. It's like, you know, if you take an aspirin a day, is that gonna prevent your heart attack or whatever? You get a few thousand people in and that study was stopped because it was shown that you had a relative uh, decrease in risk factor of 43% of the people were taking the aspirin. So as soon as that was seen, before the, the study was even finished, it was stopped because there no longer was equipoise. In other words, it wasn't ethical to not give the other people the ability mm. to take the aspirin. So when you have a feeling as a, as a clinician or researcher that uh, some that someone needs something, um, it's really hard to take it, it to, to not give it to that that person. So we've got a lot of good you know research that's coming out that is limited because of what we can do with controls or shams or what we call placebo that we can do easily on a drug trial, but we can't do as well with a hands-on uh, manipulative trial. It's like doing a controlled study with somebody that's having a delicious steak and you want to do a reverse sear or you have a placebo reverse sear, what's that? Blindfold it and keep the steak raw without any fire? I mean, uh, uh, with like a, a colored little, you know, paper flame that you can't even, you know, roast a marshmallow on it. So anyways, those are the advances. It's really exciting. Every month there's a new advance in neurology. It really has been great, whereas, for decades, it sort of just sort of, you can be really current really lazily. Now, if you're not in your wheelhouse, you're going to be not current within six months. That's the reality. So 
our scholars are very current uh, because in our classes, you know, we use a flip class, but they <clears> look at good literature. And not all literature is, is good. Not all literature has to be RCTs or has to be, you know, this or that or the other. But some, there's some really good trending uh, information that get the buzz of people. And when you look at clinical outcomes that drive research, that's what people want to see. The guy that comes out and says, you know, I'm not, I find that when I wash my hands after I come from a surgery to deliver these people that I don't have sepsis in, in the women that I deliver. And the other someone say, well, what's the evidence for that? Well, I just told you what, what I found. Well, where's the RCT? Well, there wasn't one, but okay. So let's develop one so that that observation was such, we're going to take a group of you people and wash your hands, another group that wasn't. Well, now people wash their hands. So the observations that clinicians make, we can study them or we can try to develop studies that will give us a greater evidence that this you know, works, you know, that this is superior to what we've done before. Drug studies are largely inferiority studies, and I've done, you know, quite a few of them in training. I've not been primary author because I've been sort of the skunk. But uh, when you look at drug trials, you have to show that they're no worse than the drug that's accepted already. So if you've got a drug that you utilize for a certain thing, and that drug doesn't cause a whole load of harm, doesn't do too much good or bad, it can get approved because maybe it gives a a little bit better, you know, you can help people with it. So if you have a new drug, as long as it's no worse than the other one, you can get it approved, but it doesn't mean the two of them are great. They might both have super side effects. So those inferiority studies are realistic. That's how we make advantages and, and advances. So another drug comes in, but it takes a billion dollars to bring a drug to market. It's very expensive uh, type of, uh, of uh, research. And then those drugs oftentimes have a sort of a lifetime of about 10 years until they find out that it does some things that are not great and boom, oh, then they take them off. No more thalidomide. You know, you're going to have morning sickness and, you know, the big promise is, is, is not there. Although the RCTs and things were very promising, uh, you know, before, before, you know, all these, you know, people that had uh, uh, problems. So um, th that's it. And, and I think if you, if you look at different advances, I mean, I can tell you what's happening at my medical school in my lab. Um, we think every day that we've, we've you know, found the most amazing thing that ever can happen, that everyone else in their labs are finding amazing things. It's just accelerating and our collaborations are really, are really, really uh, absolutely amazing. And hopefully, you know, we're gonna be able to find cures for neurodegeneration and things. I think personally, the biggest cure is prevention. I think that's what we're gonna see. Uh, in other words, uh, treat the diabetes before you have it, you know, with the proper diet and exercise, which is within your paradigm. Uh, treat the Parkinson's, treat the Alzheimer's before you have it. We know that people that are, have a higher level of education uh, will have the same score on an Alzheimer's test as someone that has lower education with lesser brain damage so that the educated person can have greater uh, cortical damage but still score at the same level as the other person. So we know that structure and function are related but not quantitatively depending upon your previous experience. So using your brain, uh, kinesthetic activity, walking a half an hour a day is probably your best uh, neurological treatment. But how can you walk uh, prescribe uh, walking for someone who's ataxic who could fall and kill themselves. You've got to be able to have the skills to affect the balance and, and integrity. And that's something we do very, very well. And um, a lot of the techniques we use are techniques that other people have used and shared. And then we can put a different, you know, mix onto it and, and uh, measure the outcomes and, and help, uh, help people. That's, that's the biggest thing. I think that when healthcare providers dedicate themselves to doing the best for people, and that's happening, you can see it now with these emergencies, people are coming in. I have a colleague, I, I was so excited, she sent me a note and 
Uh, she's, you know, going up from Mayo to New York to, you know, serve in this thing. I made a post, our, you know, one of our faculty members, Ahmed Hanker, is treating these COVID-19 patients that are so afraid that they're going to die. He's the, he's the only psychiatrist that now is left on staff at, at uh, the Bedlam. That's where you get the word from. That big psychiatric hospital is beautiful in London at the Mosley. He's doing an amazing thing. And his PPE is crap. They don't have it, but he's in there and he's, you know, bring it on. We're just going to do these things. Uh, I've got my other friends, you know, working emergency in Thailand and Bangkok who can tell you amazing stories. People that are colleagues. These are all Carrick Institute faculty that you know at the University of Montreal who've got them the head of uh, public health in Dubai. I've got four uh, vibrant colleagues in Riyadh at King Faisal. I have got one of my uh, colleagues that uh, is a virologist that is doing amazing, amazing, amazing work. Hopefully, you know, getting some, some answers. If you look at our Master of Science degree and you see our faculty, our Carrick Institute faculty, we've got people that are on our faculty uh, that uh, did the programs with me at Harvard and MGH that are qualified uh, medical educators that are in our program together. Whether they're at University of Massachusetts and uh, professors in anesthesiology or Montreal, we've got neuroophthalmologists, we've, we've got people, we have one, one fellow who's a very famous uh, family physician, Mo, uh, who's on our faculty that people will see, and he's in Qatar right now to, to help that country set up this idea of emerging, you know, medical care. Just an uh, unbelievable uh, humanist. Uh, another fellow, uh, Monam, is uh, a PhD neuroscientist who is just probably one of the world's experts just in uh, blood glucose delivery patterns. And he's on, on our faculty. But all of these people are in this, this fight and every day, I'm in, you know, for about three hours trying to think of how we can design the clinical trials ethically to try to measure what we're doing. And, you know, people are, hey, we got these political things like, do you give them uh, this drug, you know, and this combination of, of antibiotic and drug, you know, X, Y, Z, it seems to work in here. Why not? They'll say, other people say, well, because there could be harm, you know, you're looking at hydrochloroquine. Is there any damage? Is it super safe? Well, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, onwards and onwards. So you see a lot of art that's coming in. And we're trying to say, how can we design a trial that has the, the greatest impact? Well, if you think it's going to work, do you withhold it from somebody that could die? It's really hard. So those are the things that I'm wrestling with, and I'm not on those front lines, but I can tell you that I, I am treating several patients every day, a whole load of them that are on those front lines and people that have their life really compromised. I can help them uh, basically from this, from this chair, but hopefully when you look at these other people, they're, they're literally, I saw a picture the other day, uh, they had a doctor in scrubs and PPE carrying a cross. And it was like, you know, this whole, aspects of uh you, you know who's who's the new messiah it was a touching thing to look at so we have carrot faculty that are uh, that are putting their lives at, at risk and we've got other you know carrot scholars and faculty that are you know working actively in their office uh doing work for for people if you don't if you don't think that your your job is essential then you, you probably haven't been doing it the way you might. I know um, that patients will, will tell you that, you know, they can't live uh, or they couldn't live without the things that we can do. So if you look at concussion, when people can't even exist, suicide is really huge. People kill themselves. Uh, there's despair. Uh, we, can, we can change that, you know, that aspect of ideation. Anyways, we can ramble and ramble on, but let me tell you, the, um, the guy that uh, pulls the the radishes out of the ground that, you know, sells them to the guy that puts them on the truck that bring them over to Publix and then has a person deliver them to my, myself. These are all essential people, everyone doing their job. It's really amazing. And let me tell you what's happening for Easter. Publix has got $20 off of Vivco Champagne. 20 really?
thought, yes, twenty dollars off. Twenty oh, dollars. I may have to only on Sunday. No, no, it's it's right now. Uh, All right, well, I may, I may have to go uh, cash in on it, and now would be a good time to. To, to cut it off for today because we have more questions and we're going to get them in our, in our next session. All right, Professor? Yeah, this is just fun. Hopefully, we had something of substance. I apologize if there's nothing of, of value. But. No, 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 no. Always a pleasure to hear from you, Professor. We'll catch you on to the next show of Ted and Fred's Excellent Adventure. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool.